Hello, and welcome to today's America Walks webinar, Tribal Transportation Planning and Pedestrian Safety. This is the first webinar in our two-part Walking Towards Justice in Indian Country series. My name's Ian Thomas, State and Local Program Director with America Walks, and managing the technology today is my colleague, Kelsey Card, Operations Development and Video Manager. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors without whom these webinars would not be possible. They are the Everybody Walk Collaborative, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and their program, Active People, Healthy Nation, the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals, MIG, and Better Health. Before I introduce today's topic and guest moderator, I want to let you know that closed captioning is available under the tab marked questions in your GoToWebinar control panel, and remind you that you can send us your questions and comments in the same area of the GoToWebinar panel. We'll address as many as we can during the panel discussion portion, um, uh, and those that we don't have time for, we will ask our panelists to uh, provide written responses, which we'll post on the website along with the webinar recording. As I mentioned, today's webinar on tribal transportation planning and pedestrian safety is the first in our two-part Walking Towards Justice in Indian Country series. The second webinar on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls will be broadcast on August 12th, and we'll have more information about that at the end of today's program. As you may recall, Walking Towards Justice is our occasional webinar format in which we take a racial, economic, or social justice issue and explore how specific injustices impact walking and walkability uh, and explore solutions uh, to those situations. And we have the assistance of a group read activity of a relevant book. And again, more about that later. Today, we're focusing on tribal transportation planning and pedestrian safety and the shocking statistic that American Indians and Alaska Natives are almost five times more likely to be killed while walking than the average American. To moderate our discussion, I'm delighted to welcome Tabitha Harris, Tribal Traffic Safety Specialist with the Tribal, um, with the tribal Injury Prevention Resource Center, which serves 574 tribal nations. Previously, Tabitha served as an Indian Health Service Tribal Injury Prevention Cooperative Agreement Program Manager for the Choctaw Nation and an Injury Prevention Specialist for the Federal Tribal Transportation Assistance Program. Tabitha is a tribal member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Tabitha, over to you. Okay, thank you, Anne. Holy holy so. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for joining us for this webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about tribal transportation planning and pedestrian safety. Hopefully you'll take away something unique and learn something unique that you can implement into your tribal communities. So I'm gonna give an overview of our panelists for today. First, we have Misty Kalan. She is the Federal Highways Office of Tribal Transportation Program Planning Specialist. We have Margot Hill. She is with the Eastern Washington University Tribal Planning Program Director. Next, we have Sharon Hossum. She is with the Pueblo Laguna Planning Program Manager. And then we have Pollyanna she, Little Bull. She is with the Yakima Nation, the DNR Engineering Tribal Traffic Safety Coordinator. Before that, I forgot to talk you for, forgot to give you a little tidbit about Tribal Injury Prevention Resource Resource Center is where I work under. We are a federal we are a program that is funded by the CDC that works with tribal nations across the U.S. in motor vehicle safety. We focus on occupant protection, so that seat belts, car seats, and booster seats. So we work with tribes in the areas of providing training and technical assistance. So with COVID going on, we are operating 100% online. So if you have any training needs or any technical assistance needs, please feel free to contact us at the Tribal Injury Prevention Resource Center, and we will do our best to help you. So with that, we are gonna dive in to 
our first speaker. And our first speaker is Missy Kalan. She is the Program Planning Specialist for the Office of the Tribal Transportation at the Federal Highway Administration. She works in partnership with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to provide transportation planning, oversight, and technical assistance to tribes under the tri Tribal Transportation Program. Misty is a member of the Navajo Nation and currently resides in Mesa, Arizona. Great, thank you, Tabitha. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Misty Kwan. My role in this webinar is to provide some context, a backdrop to the information that will be shared by the rest of the presenters today. As Tabitha included in her introduction, I am the Program Planning Specialist for the Office of Tribal Transportation, or OTT. OTT is part of the larger federal lands highway within FHWA. In partnership with BIA, BIA Department of Transportation and BIA Regional Office, we are responsible for the stewardship and oversight of the Federal Lands Highway Tribal Transportation Program. Here I'm showing the respective agencies' mission statement. Together, the two agencies collaborate on many functions related to tribal transportation, as represented by the many circles in various shapes and sizes. The largest and primary circle is the Tribal Transportation Program, or TTP. So what is TTP? The Tribal Transportation Program is long-term funding, shown here in the far left column. The TTP is made possible by the enactment of a transportation law, the most recent being the FAST Act. Funds are distributed by formula to federally recognized tribes. The TTP has set-asides. These are items shown in percentages like 2% planning, which is set aside prior to distribution of formula, formula shares. Tribes do not have to compete for 2% planning, but an application and review process in a, is involved to compete for tribal transportation program safety and bridge program funds. Following the enactment of the law, we have the regulations that guide the use of TTP for the TTP, that is primarily 25 CFR Part 170. Here I've listed a few topics those regulations cover. In the final column, I'm showing the various TTP delivery options for tribes. Oops. How a tribe delivers their transportation program partly depends on their capacity. This shows options ranging from direct service in which BIA manages a tribe's program to self-governance in which the tribe has more autonomy. Stepping away from funding and into transportation planning now, my intent here is just a quick visual review of transportation planning and how challenging it can be. This is no exception in tribal communities. What I'm emphasizing here is that there are many variables and factors for a community to consider in transportation planning. As we know, it can be trying when those variables and factors are not all perfectly manageable <clears throat> to funnel out projects and activities that can be identified on a transportation improvement program or TIP. Critical issues such as pedestrian safety are personal and they have significant impact to a community. In this whirlwind of a planning funnel, it can be challenging to maintain focus on such issues. As a result, the community's critical needs are not included on the TIP. Well, the TIP is not a guarantee that a project gets delivered, but if a project or activity does not even make the TIP, even the opportunity to document the priority is lost. So how do we keep pedestrian safety and other needs so that they don't escape or stick to the sides of the funnel? I'll come back to this question later, but first let's take a look at the state of pedestrian safety in tribal communities. The Tribal Transportation Strategic Safety Plan has documented five emphasis topics that are intended to be addressed at a national level to improve transportation safety in tribal areas. One of these five is pedestrian safety. I would like to highlight two points from this slide. One is that a large percentage of pedestrian fatalities occur in dark conditions, typically after 5 p.m. Data shows that this is also true on a national basis. The top right corner of my slide shows that about 75% of pedestrian fatalities occur after dark. 
The other point is that there is a 2 to 32% lower incident count than those reported by state vital records. I don't know the exact figures, but when I participated on road safety assessment teams for tribal areas, we frequently found a similar situation in which the tribe often had more crash data not accounted for in the state systems. So we had to be sure to incorporate the tribe's data in the final RSA findings. This map is showing pedestrian fatalities in tribal areas. The states with the highest pedestrian fatalities are the darkest, Arizona, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. Nationally, five states, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, and Texas, accounted for almost half, 46% of all pedestrian deaths during the first six months of 2018. Further, New Mexico has the highest rate of pedestrian deaths per resident population. This infographic is showing that more than a third of pedestrian fatalities occur on local streets. In tribal communities, oftentimes state highways bisect communities or are the main thoroughfare. This graph shows state highways as the second highest type of roadway. The Strategic Safety Plan analyzed 346 crashes, which this graph represents. It complements the previous infographic that I showed you such that overall, 77% of pedestrian fatalities occur on roads, not at an intersection or marked crosswalk. Nationally, 72% 72, 72 do not occur at an intersection shown in the bottom right, also implying open roads. In the urban areas, 65 urban and road fatalities likely represent those that occurred along local streets and in the rural areas, the state highways. According to the Pedestrian Safety and Native America report, many fatal, fatal American Indian, Alaska Native pedestrian crashes occur in this order, from urban principal roadway to rural arterial to rural collector and then rural, local rural roads and streets. In other words, from high to low capacity, from high to low speeds. The point is that the probability of a fatality is significantly greater at higher speeds on a higher capacity roadway. According to the Native America report, 50% of all American Indian Alaska Native pedestrian fatalities occur with speeds greater than 50 miles per hour. This infographic is showing pedestrian fatalities in tribal areas by gender and age. According to the to the uh, strategic safety plan data set, males 21 to 30 years of age account for pedestrian fatalities in tribal areas, close in range to the pedestrian safety in Native America report, which states that incidents frequently involve males 35 to 39 years of age. Both publications show a high percentage of impaired pedestrian fatalities. According to NHTSA, report on national statistics, alcohol impairment for driver and or pedestrian was reported in about half of traffic crashes resulting in pedestrian fatalities in 2017. An estimated 32% of fatal pedestrian crashes involved a pedestrian with a blood alcohol concentration of 0 0.08 or higher, and the impaired pedestrian fatalities occurred in 21 to 54 years of age. I think it is safe to say from these infographics that the use of cell phone has steadily increased, quintupled from 2010 to 2017, and, then, and within the past few years, a 4,000% increase in wireless data usage. So not only do we have phones, we are using them a lot. From navigation to smart health apps, shopping, socializing, our lives are increasingly integrated with the use of what these phones have to offer. As amazing as they are, I share these graphs because smartphones are another point of distraction on the roadway and further analysis is needed, but data, ironically, is in, um, regarding data is in its infancy. So why is pedestrian fatality so prevalent in tribal communities? The answer is each tribal community is different in their circumstances and their challenges are unique. The Pedestrian Safety in Native America study has identified 
these items as the barriers to pedestrian safety improvement efforts. Most are self-explanatory, others such as engineers, I take to mean as a need for technical expertise and building technical capacity in general. And now we're back to our question, how do we keep pedestrian safety and other needs in focus so that they don't escape or stick to the sides of that planning funnel? Again, I want to repeat that each tribal government and its people and environment is different. So transportation planning challenges are unique to their circumstances. However, based on my experience in working with tribes on transportation planning, I have found a few considerations. I've organized this slide so that it emphasizes how pedestrian safety challenges or other issues for that matter can be kept in the conversation through these broad areas, which is not at all inclusive. In orange, I've noted the LRTP processes. I will give emphasis to three of these. First is partnership. Working together, we can, almost miraculously, I think, get things done especially when it comes to having data, particularly for safety issues. For the data to be most compelling, to tell its story, it must be accurate, it must be complete, of quality, meaningful, useful, relevant, it has to have integrity, respect privacy, easily but securely accessible, and reduces assumptions. I realize this is a tall order, but I think the planning process facilitates making this possible. It brings in people with knowledge, enthusiasm, and innovation to the table to help tackle this process. The second is stakeholders, which to me, again, is like partnering. I found in tribal planning efforts, asking special interest groups to join planning, planning efforts bring invaluable perspectives. I've observed youth groups, sometimes more formally called youth councils, that have identified trails and paths that others did not know of such that if a different path was constructed, it would not would have been an effective use of TTP funds because the new trail would not have met the needs of the primary users. The last item I have listed here is visioning. This again, because each community is unique. Who best than the members of that community to decide what the best solutions are? And it begins with the big picture. Is it a vision for having a safe and accessible network for non-motorized transportation? Or is it broader, providing access to jobs and healthcare? For that particular community, does that mean better pedestrian facilities? I like the saying from Robert Iger, former CEO and president of Disney, convey your priorities and repeatedly. In the project development cycle, there's no better place in my opinion than in planning to start and repeat. So I say no better time than planning, so why is that? As this graph shows in the planning phase, your stakeholder influence risk and uncertainty is high, but the cost of making any changes is low. In construction, the opposite is true when planning is minimized or eliminated in transportation project delivery. This often results in canceled projects, significant issues or delays, increased costs, perhaps political consequences, or rarely delivering a project that might not even be effective as I um, referenced on the trail project. So I think I've more than maxed out my time and I will turn it back to Tabitha at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Next up, we have Margo Hill. Margo is a Spokane tribal member and was raised on the Spokane Indian Reservation. She is the director of the Eastern Washington University Tribal Planning Program, where she also teaches urban and regional planning. Previously, Margo worked in the legal field to protect tribal sovereignty, provide legal counsel to the tribal council, and insist in the revision of the tribal law and order codes. Now I will turn it over to Margo. Welcome to our, our webinar, and I'm going to just share with you some of the challenges uh, for tribal transportation and pedestrian safety in Indian country. Um, we have, you know, top-notch tribal planners out there that are working hard in tribal communities, 
um, yet we face these unique challenges in Indian country. So I'm going to try to quickly explain some of these issues. Um, you know, we face challenges not only of the geography and topography, but also uh, the engineering aspect. We have no shoulders on our highways uh, for people to walk safely. Um, so some of these challenges come uh, within Indian country, uh, you know, federal policies, history, uh, how we were dispossessed of our lands. These are all unique land tenure issues that exist in Indian country. We have fee property and trust property that creates this checkerboard pattern that I'll explain to you. Um, and then there's questions of who's responsible for pedestrian safety. And then understanding that tribes have many challenges uh, regarding funding, we don't have our own civil engineers in many cases. Most tribes have to uh, contract that, that, that out and it's very expensive. This is one example of a reservation. The Cobble Indian Reservation is a large land-based reservation, 1.4 million acres. You know, many state highways going through the uh, reservation, you know, state routes like 97, um, and uh, there's, you know, problems, you know, through these major highways on the reservation, uh, Highway 155. This reservation has three counties. So when you have those multiple jurisdictions, it can cause uh, uh, stress and a lot of confusion on whose responsibility. Um, as an attorney, I come at this from kind of an Indian law perspective. Um, you know, federal Indian law is a very complex area of the law, but you have to understand a little bit to understand uh, land tenure, which is the basis of all uh, planning and land use in Indian country. So, you know, we are very careful in Indian country because when we create law, uh, if we have bad facts, it, it creates bad case law for all the other tribes. Um, and when we're looking at statutory construction, uh, the, the law is supposed to be read in favor of the tribes because they were at a disadvantage. Uh, you know, canons of construction, um, I encourage you uh, to look at uh, Judge Canby uh, for a uh, federal Indian law nutshell. Um, I teach these courses over three months, so it's hard to, you know, give you a little snapshot of Indian law in just 10 or 12 minutes. Um, as was mentioned, uh, every tribe is history. Every tribe's history is different. Um, you know, some were established by treaty, which is a bilateral agreement between the government and the tribe. Uh, some were established by executive order, which is a unilateral uh, agreement from the the president to the tribe. Uh, but you need to understand the words of the treaty or the executive order um, that it. It explains that tribe's history for land use um, and land tenure. Uh, later in the webinar, we're going to have uh, uh, Haliana from the Yakima Nation, and that tribe, you know, their treaty language, it, you know, it was uh, interpreted by the United States Supreme Court just last year. So these are very relevant cases. We, we still look at treaties and examine their language. Uh, the Yakima Nation has a unique mobility pattern in which the Supreme Court made a decision regarding fuel tax, the, the Cougar Den case. Um, I won't read this out, but Indian country, um, it, it has a very specialized meaning. Um, it, it, it's the rights of way, it's the reservation lands, it's uh, all Indian communities like Pueblos. Um, so there's a specific definition. We're talking about Indian allotments. Those allotments may be off of the, the main reservation. Um, we have lands out in Airway Heights or up in Chihuahua. Uh, so sometimes you're gonna be dealing with Indian country and it may not be within the boundaries, but those still are reservation lands, Indian country and lands that we reserve to ourselves. Um, to understand Indian country, you must understand that there are three separate sovereigns, these layers, if you will. You'll have us the, the, the the tribe, this for my example, I have the Spokane tribal government. You have the tribal laws, tribal court, maybe BIA police. You'll have federal laws. If you have a, a major crime, a murder, rape, arson, then you have uh, the U.S. Di district attorneys that's coming in. You'll have FBI agents that investigate the case. And then uh, the county, your state laws, you'll have a, a court, a county court and maybe a sheriff. If you are, if you're dealing with criminal laws and you have a non-Indian, you may have to call in the local county sheriff. 
So this is a, a slide that I like to illustrate where you have these layers. You have tribal laws, state laws, and federal laws. And it makes for a very complicated uh, planning situation in which uh, transportation planners have to work through uh, these different layers uh, to do any kind of land use planning. In, in the legal realm, when we talk about property law, you have a bundle of sticks, which is kind of your bundle of rights. If you have fee simple absolute, you have all of those rights. You can grant a right away, you, you can write, you have the right to transfer your ownership, lease it, sell it, all of those things. That's the fee simple absolute, you have the full bundle of sticks. In Indian country, we have multiple types of land holdings. We have fee simple absolute, where you have all the bundle of sticks, no you have the no encumbrance, clear title, you can grant those right of ways. That fee land is taxed by the United States government. Uh, the trust land, which is a, a commonly held land uh, tenure on the Indian reservation, it's held by the United States government in trust for that tribe, for the Spokane tribe or for that indiv individual Indian Margo Hill. So you have these different types of land status, which creates this checkerboarded kind of nature uh, that causes so much jurisdictional issues. Every land use question, um, it, it, it will depend, the answer will depend on who owns title to the property. So here's an example of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And you can see uh, that you have tribal trust land, tribal fee land, um, non-Indian ownership, and having this che checkerboard pattern um, really uh, is, is a difficult challenge that transportation planners have to deal with. When we look at the checkerboard pattern, we have jurisdictional problems. If it's a criminal law, um, let's say it's a domestic violence, um, there's a, a problem with no jurisdiction over non-Indians that might be perpetrating the, the violence. If it's a civil law, you have this very difficult to understand Montana test. Um, and you know there, there's these different prongs on how to understand if the tribe has jurisdiction. Uh, the, the United States Supreme Court has you know, uh, read a number of cases, A1 straight, and cases that have made it real difficult to understand how we interpret a uh, uh, law when it comes to the Indian reservation. Also, there's environmental problems. If you have non-Indians or non-tribal folks living on the reservation that are polluting the water or polluting the land, you have to look at other federal laws like the Clean Water Act to get jurisdiction. And then there are zoning problems like we've seen in the Brendale case. This is a uh, infographic that uh, one of our friends, Kelly, out of the um, National Indian uh, Justice Center in California developed. And you can see that the different problems from land ownership What's the status of land, right-of-ways, liability? Who has liability? Is it the federal, the tribal? Is it the local county? Um, who are the type of road users? Uh, regulatory jurisdiction issues. Um, you know, sometimes you have uh, PL280 states uh, and tribes like the Yakima Nation, who we'll hear from later, decided to retrocede that jurisdiction. And it caused a number of issues with the Washington State Patrol and um, who was going to patrol those roadways. And of course, we know from federal law that some of those state right-of-ways uh, create jurisdiction in which the Washington State Patrol has an obligation to patrol those highways. But we have civil jurisdiction and then layers of criminal jurisdiction. But some tools that we can consider for intergovernmental working relationships, we can have intergovernmental cooperative agreements, we can have cross deputization agreements. Uh, we work through tribes throughout the state in the Northwest region, and we found that there were a lot of tribes that worked with local uh, counties and, and sheriff departments very well. Um, sometimes uh, we go into MOUs and MOAs, and we contract out our emergency management services or our fiber services. So there's a lot of uh, uh, good working relationships in Indian country. However, we still have some challenges. There is implicit bias, and some folks uh, can be more difficult to uh, work with. Again, the Yakima Nation had to uh, uh, litigate an issue to have a, a section, section D of their, rec of their reservation recognized. In this last slide, I just want to show you that a model that we created at the Eastern Washington University. And when we talk about tribal transportation safety, we know that at the very center of the issue is everybody's individual choice. We need to make sure that our tribal members aren't working at night, 
um, that we create safe roadways where we have a shoulder um, and where people are wearing a bright reflective clothing when they're walking at night, um, that we reduce the number of people that are drinking and driving and lessen the, the chance of pedestrians getting hit. But it takes all of us. It's the tribal council, the tribal law enforcement, our planning department. It takes our court uh, staff, our judges and prosecutors um, that are in, enforcing DUIs, our health and human services who provide treatment uh, to our tribal members. There are people, so we want them to get healthy and clean. Our EMS folks who are on the scene to scoop up our folks and get them to hospital and our roads and, and tribal transportation folks to get good engineering practices on the reservation so we have signage and safe roadways. So it's all of these folks, you know, we, so the traditional E model uh, along with the at three E's with, along with the leadership um, and then the the outside of the circle again is working with local state jurisdictions. I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Margo. Next, we have uh, Sharon Halsum. She is the planning program manager for the Pueblo of Laguna. She is the adjunct faculty at the University of New Mexico, where she teaches planning on Native American lands and is an instructor for the Northern Arizona U University Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. Sharon is also affiliated with the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. I'll hand it over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Tabitha, and thank you um, for having me on this panel today. I'm going to talk about the Pueblo of Laguna's Bike and Pedestrian Route Project. The Pueblo of Laguna is in New Mexico. Um, it is located in four different counties. So we have some of those jurisdictional issues that Margo was talking about. And the primary residential area of the Pueblo of Laguna is in Cibola County, New Mexico. There are six distinct villages in the Pueblo of Laguna. They range in population from about 200 people in the village of Ensenal, which is in the northwest part um, to about 1,200 people in the village of Laguna, which is considered the capital of the Pueblo. Um, and you can see that down on the, the bottom middle of this map. The Pueblo has, as most tribes do, transportation safety and health issues. Of course, traditionally, um, all transportation on the Pueblo's lands would have been by walking. And now there is motorized transportation and there are conflicts between pedestrians, bicyclists and motorized vehicle transportation. That is aggravated by the fact that the roads through the Pueblo are not designed to support pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, a lot of them also, as Margot was pointing out, are state highways. One of the main drivers behind this bike and pedestrian planning project was a bicycle fatality on the main state road that runs through the Pueblo, which is New Mexico Highway 124. We also have other roads um, where they are deemed to be so unsafe by lack of shoulders or any facilities that would allow for safety that running, walking, and jogging are prohibited on the, the roadway. In addition to the pedestrian safety itself, this is a contributing factor to other health problems on the Pueblo. Um, problems of obesity and then health issues that are exacerbated by obesity, such as diabetes. And there's a really strong interest in increasing walking activity and also bicycling on the Pueblo for recreation as well as transportation to improve health conditions. Another aspect of the, the bicycling and pedestrian needs are really the connectivity between the villages themselves and then a variety of institutional and commercial facilities. So what this map is showing is just the different facilities in the area of the village of Parahi and the village of Laguna. In the village of Laguna, there are a lot of government offices. There's an elementary and middle school, community health and wellness department, the post office, the library. 
Um, in the village of Parahi, there's an area that's designated for a community campus. There's a health clinic that's going up there. There's also a lot of housing in the area. There are some low-income housing subdivisions. Um, the main commercial area for the Pueblo, which has a grocery store, is also located in the village of Parahi, as is a high school. But we have a tremendous number also of unsafe intersections in the area. Um, this intersection I will come back to, but in the bottom photo you can see there's a gas station and um, a convenience store. Um, the top photo, the arrow is pointing to the small green sign which directs people to the elementary school and the middle school. And this is a five-way uncontrolled intersection. Quite uncomfortable to get across as a pedestrian and uncomfortable to get across even in a vehicle. So the planning program undertook village comprehensive plans with each of the six villages. And had that community input. Misty was talking about visioning and the goals of the community. And so this is what we did. We went out to each village and asked them about their vision for the community. And this is a sample just from the village of Parahi. And you can see two of the goals there. One is community members of all ages are physically fit. And another goal is all modes of travel, whether by private vehicles, transit, biking, walking, or assistive devices are safe. And all of the villages have comprehensive plans now and all of the villages spoke to the importance of these goals. That is what led the Pueblo of Laguna to seek funding to do bike and pedestrian route planning. We had the, the directive from the six villages and we received Tiger II funding. Um, this was back in 2010 to do planning and design for bike and pedestrian routes. And we continued the tremendous amount of community involvement. One of the key things that we did was have a community biking and walking advisory group, um, which was made up of representatives from each of the six villages. We also did workshops, focus groups, we had field tours to different areas where bike and pedestrian facilities were needed, and we did a survey. Um, the survey results reiterated the barriers to walking and biking really related to safety. People are also concerned about snakes and dogs, um, but you know some of the, the key issues are narrow roads with no shoulders and other vehicles and no sidewalks or trails. And you can also see in the, the pie chart that people want to walk or bike for exercise and for transportation. The bike and pedestrian route planning process looked at existing routes. The key element in this map really is that most of these routes show up as red, which means poor condition for biking and walking. And people are walking along roadways. So what the plan, going through that, that process and then um, looking at existing conditions the plan has a wide range of recommended improvements um, and all kinds of different, different treatments for those roadways to improve them for bike and pedestrian safety. There are recommendations for um, multi-purpose asphalt paths, crusher fine paths, natural surface paths, a shoulder bikeway in one of the longer connections where people are, are less likely to walk but could still ride a bike. Um, sidewalks, signed routes, and then other, other possibilities as well. These then had to be prioritized, and in order to prioritize the recommendations, the Pueblo also developed a system of trail improvements. And what you see on this map, the green routes are what were called Pueblo routes, and those serve transportation purposes. The village routes are more small scale and recreational, and then the linking routes are a mid-range route. And this led us then to a route priority map overall. The next phase of the project then was to take those prioritized routes and move them forward into engineering design. We had three contracts to do that up front. 
One of them was for a road known as Casablanca Road, and that road was, the road itself was currently in design. And so we piggybacked the trail along it with the road design. We also had a design for a roundabout at that five-way uncontrolled intersection and a road diet. And if you're not familiar with a road diet, that means taking generally a four-lane road, removing some of the vehicle lanes and creating bike and pedestrian facilities along the side instead. And then we had a third contract to design the rest of the priority routes and get those to where they would be shovel ready to go to construction when we could get construction funding. So the design process went through, of course, the, the engineering with surveys and different levels of design, looking at right of way. We had to get lighting agreements in place. Um, most of the priority transportation routes are along those state highways. The state does not want to pay the bill for lighting on the, the trails, so there has to be an agreement in place to manage that. And the, the state's design process also requires thorough certifications that other utilities will not be affected by this. And then, of course, there are environmental clearances as well. Um, if we're, you know, we were using federal funding for these, and so all of those need to, to go through as well, including cultural clearances, um, and particularly given that this is on tribal lands. This is a schematic of that roundabout, and the, the key feature um, that is notable here are those little crosswalks. The roundabouts are much safer for pedestrians and also for vehicles lot easier, although some people do have some trouble, they are actually easier to navigate and slow traffic down. And of course, slowing traffic down is one way of reducing pedestrian injury and fatality. Um, we have a, a feature in the middle of the roundabout which recognizes Laguna culture and heritage and also that this is part of historic Route 66. This is a sketch of the road diet. This one is not built quite yet, um, but you can see in the top left slide that we have four lanes of traffic, two in each direction. And if you look in the graphic um, design, the sketch in the bottom right, some of that has been changed to bike and pedestrian travel. And the upper right drawing shows that as well. And so we have been successful in getting funding now that we have this fully community supported plan and designs that got the project shovel ready, we've been able to get funding to actually build some of these trails. And this was the first one to be built. Um, this one provides access to the middle school and we were able to combine funding through the BIA, Tribal Transportation Program. This is a BIA road and also through a program that New Mexico has, the Tribal Infrastructure Fund. We were able to combine the, the same sorts of funding for Casablanca Road and Rainfall Road. Again, um, these are roads on the, the BIA inventory and they were slated for construction. So we combined that BIA transportation, tribal transportation program funding with state funding to get the trails built at the same time we were building, rebuilding the roadways. The roundabout was funded with a different source of funding, um, Federal Highway Administration Highway Safety Improvement Program funding. And that funding actually went to the New Mexico DOT for construction, but the construction was done based on the plans that the Pueblo developed using the Tiger II funding. And this improvement um, required some of that crash data that Misty was talking about. We have received a second Tiger grant. Um, we may be the only community in the country to get two Tiger grants. We received Tiger VII funding in 2015 to continue to build the network along New Mexico Highway 124. One of these segments has been built, one is under construction now, uh, and another one will be under construction with that, that Tiger 7 funding. And we also have um, recreational trails program funding and transportation alternatives program funding through the state of New Mexico to get these built. 
A lot of the success of this project is really due to partnerships. I mentioned the Community Biking and Walking Advisory Group, which had representatives from each of the six villages. Um, we worked with all the programs and departments in the Pueblo. We had excellent consultants on the planning side and on the engineering design side. Um, we worked with different entities at the Pueblo, the agencies, Federal Highway Administration, New Mexico DOT. We have councils of governments um, and Bureau of Indian Affairs, and also just a little coordination with the National Park Service Rivers and Trails Conservation Assistance Program. So the key elements for our success in this project really started off with that community involvement, the community's vision through the comprehensive plans and then in the bike and pedestrian route plan. All of our partnerships, the prioritization, getting that engineering design work done as much as possible before we even add money for construction, combining trail projects with current road projects and that combination of the BIA TTP money and also the state money, getting things packaged for funding, and really our persistence. The council adopted this plan in 2012, and we are still plugging along and getting more funding to actually build the projects. And with that, I will turn it back over to Tabitha. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. So now we will go to Holly Ann a little bowl. She is the Tribal Traffic Safety Coordinator for the Yakima Nation Department of Natural Resources Engineering Program. She has worked in the public safety sector for 30 years, serving as a, a, a medic, a firefighter, a police officer, and a road supervisor. Hollyanna has also authored and co-authored Washington State Laws and Tribal Law Codes, including, including a quickly needed child restraint law. Pollyanna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, Shaklawit, Amy Manaimama, Tima, Wanahitai, Inktashwanichas, Tima. Hello, my name is Hollyanna Littlebull, and I'd like to thank you everybody for coming here today. And I'd like to share our pedestrian program that we have here at Yakima Nation. So Yakima Nation is in Yakima County and Klickitat County, these two counties right here. And they, are, they show the highest number of, of Native American, Alaska Native fatalities in Washington state from 2010 through 2016. This map shows this line here is Highway 97. This is Union Gap up here on the very top of the screen going through Parker, Wapato, Toppenish, and then going south towards Goldendale, and then 220 and 223 going towards Mabton. And you can see here the epicenter of the fatalities and critical injuries is in Toppenish here, and then Highway 97 has the second highest. So we were interested in um, getting a lot of data so that we could show that we, we knew that there was pedestrian fatalities, but without that data, we weren't able to back up and make data informed decisions. And so one of the things that helped us is when Eastern Washington University and Margo and her program helped do a safety management plan. And so this is helping us along with the data that we are collecting recently to show that pedestrian deaths do occur um, almost 80 percent a little over 80 percent of the time from 4 p.m to 5 a.m and as you can see there times of death so the other thing that we started looking at was not only um, pedestrians but pedicyclists motorcyclists and other um, types of fatalities but this one is more for the heritage connectivity trail a grant that we were able to get because of the safety plan that was approved last august by Tribal Council and we did a survey and so mapped in brown is where the uh, community members said that they wanted trails based on the survey. 
And so you can see that the reservation is outlined in pink and you can see the communities there, Wapanish and Wapato, Hera, Fort Simcoe, Goldendale. So we started looking at um, working with WashDOT closely and we started to evaluate what were possible segments that we could look at. And so what we're doing is we're piggybacking on two roundabout projects that will be happening. And so this one here shows from right about here on McDonald Road and Highway 97 where a roundabout is gonna be put in is that th we might be able to piggyback on that project to create the first walking trail into Toppenish. And so I just wanted to show that some of the trails that we're looking at, and this is all according to the survey that was done that tribal members answered on where they wanted the trails. And so this was the basis of our plan. So we started doing community outreach, doing surveys, talking to the, the people and seeing what they wanted. And then we took and we mapped all the data that we were able to get from Washington State, from the county, from the tribe, uh, because as Margo mentioned, we have multiple jurisdictions within the reservation. We have Wapato City Police, Toppenish City Police, Union Gap City Police, uh, Sheriff's Department, State Patrol, which is not patrolling at this time, and then Tribal Police. And you can see here that the red area marks the epicenter of where all the fatalities are occurring between 2000 and 10 and 2016. And then that red line ends at McDonald Road and Highway 97. And then the orange is the second highest where the fatalities are occurring along Highway 97 from Union Gap going towards Toppenish. And then the third highest being yellow from Wapato to Donald. And then from Lateral A and Highway 97 along Lateral A going towards Fort Road. And then from Fort Road from about Robbins Road going out to White Swan. And so this distance here from Toppenish to White Swan is approximately 22 miles, Toppenish to Wapato 7, Wapato to Parker 7, and Parker to Union Gap is another three miles. So what I did is I went out to go find pedestrians in their normal routes of travel where they are traveling. And as you can see here, this woman here is walking along and she is got her knee on the seat of her wheelchair and she's pushing herself and as you can see she's exiting out of the pedestrian zone and into the lane of traffic and this is adjacent to ihs this woman was seen getting off a bus at the pato bus stop across the street and she's literally running through traffic to cross the road in Toppenish on east fort road this is another woman that also got off the bus at Pato Crossing, excuse me, Pato Bus Stop. And I like this picture because it shows all of the different hazards that we have here that you really can't see if you're, if you're not there. Showing the entrance into Highway 97, Fort Road Crossing at, a, at an odd angle. We also have Linden Street, which is where the tribal school is. This young man is, I saw leaving tribal school and he's walking north along Linden Street and there's no sidewalks as you can see, he's having to walk where the lane of traffic travels. And you can see Kirkwood Elementary in the background there. And this was before <clears throat> you can see the arrow on the left points to the entrance to tribal school and another pedestrian and then the young man in the background. This is Ward Road, and I really like this one because um, this is right off of Highway 97. And as you can see that there's all of this congestion, both ingress and egress. You can see the, the students walking in the, crossing the road in the background. There's no shoulder, no sidewalk, no crosswalk. And the school zone, it's listed as 35 miles an hour. So this is one um, intersection that we're really looking at. This is another one that we're looking at. 
this is where that red line ends on Highway 97, where it starts to turn orange. As you can see, the box culvert in the background that goes over the irrigation drain and canal, the guardrails push the pedestrian closer into the line of traffic. And as you can see, this elderly woman is walking against traffic and she's walking as far right as she can. But you can see back behind her where there's the clearance between her and the guardrail and the lane of traffic is approximately a little over two feet. And so she's pushed really close into traffic and the traffic is going, uh, the limit is 55 miles an hour, but we have, because of no state patrol, there's speeding going on at this time. This is in Wapato. This young man is uh, crossing over Highway 97 and Frontage Road, which have no crosswalks. So when I was out um, taking pictures, I noticed this young lady who was, who I saw leaving Mama Chut area. So the areas that have the pink have no sidewalks, the orange has a, has a shoulder and the green has a sidewalk. So she makes this route twice a day. I saw her again crossing over Frontage Street and going towards, going west on West Wapato. Saw her walking west on West Wapato. And I made the assumption that maybe she was gonna go towards the Head Start. So this is looking from the Head Start, looking towards West Wapato, where you can see there's no shoulder. There's not very much room to walk. And sure enough, I found her at the, the Head Start. And to my surprise, was she not uh, pushing one child in the stroller, but she had two children. The older brother was holding the younger brother on his lap, and she makes this route twice a day. And so one of the things that we started using, and this is one of the most stolen posters that we make, is because um, we want people to not be like Bigfoot and be seen. And so we're using the dual language and then we do community outreach at all the events that we can <clears throat> get to. This is our team. You can see Margo there and our team at WashDOT who we've made, built a great working relationship with. They joined us for the Treaty Day Parade last year. And that's my presentation and my contact information. Thank you, Holly Anna. So now we have reached the end of the webinar series. So now we're going to move into the discussions. So I have a couple of questions that have been entered in. So if you still have questions, please submit them in through the chat and we'll get them uh, filtered through. So my first question I have is for Misty. It says, what agency or entity within a tribal government collects crash data that is more comprehensive than state level crash data for tribal lands, as mentioned. Okay, so you kind of cut out, but um, the gist of the question is where else can we get data, is that correct? Correct. Um, typically when I worked on RSA teams, um, so we worked with the tribal police department and the health departments to collect some of that information. And oftentimes um, the tribal transportation folks have some information as well, but typically we've worked with health professionals and um, police and emergency contacts. Okay, and before that, I forgot to have the panelists. I'm sorry. Could you please turn your webcams on? Here we are. Okay, there we are. Okay, so the next okay. question I have is Tabitha, I was going to also offer that it's maybe an opportunity for your youth to get involved um, and some of your college students at Eastern Washington University. We had a number of our college students from, from the Colville tribe work on data and um, research and mark and map 
uh, some of the fatalities along their reservation highways. It was an opportunity for them to go back to their tribe and uh, document uh, because they know the community and they know tribal law enforcement. Um, so I'd encourage your college students to offer some summer internships for your tribal member students. And does anyone else have anything to add to that to where you can locate other crash data for a tribal community? A lot of my data comes from not only Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, um, but I also use uh, Whisker and um, FARS data as well, um, because I'm finding that sometimes that for whatever reason, all of the, the, the data doesn't add up when you add up the state data and the tribal data. Sometimes there's discrepancies there. And so when I check the other systems, that helps um, make the data more accurate. Another question we had was, does Indian country land include control on state highway right of way? So I, I would answer yes, it's a concurrent jurisdiction. Um, both the, the tribe and, and the state has some responsibility on those roadways. When I served as, as my tribe's attorney, um, they could not find a legal right of way. Uh, which is the problem in most uh, on most reservations, you have a federal agency, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who has a realty department, and people don't always bother to get legal right-of-ways um, in Indian country. That's another part of not having any shoulders or having any uh, protective safety along the reservation uh, roadways and the state highways. Nobody wants to pay tribal people for the rights of way to provide that safety shoulder. Um, but it, it's both of the tribe always does its best. Um, we do not have uh, taxes, a tax base that's coming in to fill our coffers to fix those roads. But we often have uh, fuel tax agreements in which we generate some revenue and that we put back um, into creating safe roadways and providing for law enforcement. And if, if I could also add to that, um, Tabitha, that rights of way um, were one of the, the issues is our, an ongoing issue also at the, the Pueblo of Laguna, um, and they are in question there as well. The documentation of exactly how the state of New Mexico came to place this road on Pueblo of Laguna land um, is a little iffy. And so the Pueblo is working with the Department of Transportation to try to clarify that. But in the meantime, it does become an issue when putting in bike and pedestrian trails and also for the environmental clearances and what the state's authority is to manage those environmental clearances. Anybody else have any comments? Panelists? Okay. Our next question is for everyone. Do you have any, do you have to deal with any archeological issues? Um, I can start on that one that we definitely um, went through a process of doing cultural resource surveys for all of our bike and pedestrian routes. Um, at the time we started this process, we were going through the State Historic Preservation Office, um, but since then the Pueblo of Laguna has created a Tribal Historic Preservation Office, which has made the process go a bit smoother. Um, we did not have any sites within the the routes that, um, that were prioritized for construction at the, the Pueblo of Laguna. Um, we had some other cultural resource issues that became very interesting. It turns out that, you know, having New Mexico Highway 124 also be historic Route 66 complicated our process substantially, um, but we didn't have any archaeological sites, per se, on the, um, the bike and pedestrian routes. Does anyone else want to comment on that question? We have our own archaeological department, and we also have historic preservation officers as well that work within the tribe. Um, and so we work really closely with them, knowing that we're going to have 
uh, projects in the future so that they are on board with us and knowing that you know these projects are coming up and so it's it does really complicate issues especially if you know that some of the areas used to have village sites on it um, that makes a huge complication but it's a process but it's doable Another question was, has there been any partnership or outreach with Safe Routes to School, the national program, or is, or is the possibility of your state Safe Routes to School department, have there been any partnerships with either um, resources? I'll start with that. Um, we are currently working on Linden Street, which is where the tribal school is, to make that um, the the tribe, the council adopted a school zone so that that street will have a reduced speed. And we're also working on Jackson Street extension, which would also um, provide a safer route for parents to go to the schools to pick up their kids so that they're not flying off of Highway 97, as you saw onto the street that's less than a quarter of a mile away for the school and so it's really difficult to see vehicles that would slow down from 55 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour within that area but if we get that project to go through that will also provide safety for Toppenish High School. <laughs> Another question is how do you coordinate with your counties when a county road is your ha biggest hazard, but they do not provide any engineering or safety audits. It's hard to get funding without these audits or permission from the county first. So Yakima Nation and Yakima County are currently working on a memorandum of agreement for working on building on projects that we have. So the first one that we worked on was on South Wapato and Progressive. And that was a collaboration between the county and the tribe to make one of the most dangerous intersections safer. And so it's a process that's still being worked out, but we have successfully built agreements on single projects, but now we want to make that project to go furthermore. And the county has joined our monthly tribal traffic safety committee meetings. And so being there, you know, on a monthly basis, hearing about the projects that we want to work on in the future and uh, projects that are going closer to coming forth to breaking ground, it's really helped having not only Yakima County, but also Washington State Department of Transportation attending our meetings. I, I agree. I think it's sound, um, the partnership, building that relationship is critical, as Hollyanna suggested. Um, I think that a lot of times um, RSAs, road safety assessments or road safety audits, um, the road owners typically have, you know, liability concerns about the recommendations that come out of those um, RSAs. But I find that if you find a mutual interest to to all the parties and then you kind of walk through and have a good discussion on the recommendations and um, even, you know, because the RSAs will provide immediate um, measures and then you'll have some midterm and long-term measures identified in those audits or safety assessments. So I think if you just talk through with your partner on what gets documented and what both parties feel comfortable with, then you have a more willing partner to collaborate with you on an issue that's in both that's both in your interests. Okay, we'll have to take two more questions. This says, is there a need to conduct a driver public information campaign to educate them about the changes to the trails or lanes to improve safety? Can you repeat that question, please? 
Yes, it says, is there a need to conduct a driver public information campaign to educate them about the changes to trails, um, road diets, lanes that are designed to improve safety? I will say that it's definitely a good idea if we're putting in a roundabout. Um, a lot of people don't know how to use roundabouts, and that would be a good. We we looked for informational materials, and we um, didn't didn't get any developed in time. But I would highly recommend if you're putting in roundabouts that you provide some educational materials about how to use them. Okay, so to piggyback off that question, how did you educate the community pedestrians and drivers? Uh, on using the new facilities or roundabouts. So what are some creative ways that you use to get that safety campaign out there about the changes? Um, I, I would share that I, I seen at the Yakima Nation, uh, some of the uh, Portia and some of the staff, they were at basketball tournaments, they were at community events, Yakima Treaty Days, uh, Holly Anna and her staff invited Washington Traffic Safety Commission and Eastern Washington University out. We participated in their Treaty Days parade. Um, we distributed pamphlets and the the information uh, had a, a tribal appropriate design. Um, we went to the people um, and were in their gymnasiums and when they had bouncy house, houses for the kids, we visited with parents. Um, uh, Holly Anna and the Yakima Nation traffic safety staff uh, talked about roundabouts. There was a lot of resistance uh, to roundabouts in tribal communities, but that's partially because um, in the Yakima city, there were these double roundabouts that um, were not labeled very well and were very confusing and scary to me. Um, so there was some resistance even up to tribal council, but because the staff did such a good job educating the community and working with the community and met them where they played and lived and worked, um, I think it went really well. Awesome. When I worked at the state um, Arizona Department of Transportation, there was a new roundabout that was put in place on a major state highway, and um, I was involved in creating a how-to guide that was published in both the English version and one that was completely in Navajo targeted to the elderly. Um, and so we made it fun and we made it simple and we made it so that all of the language was um, on that particular flyer was all in um, Navajo. Nice. Thank you for that. I want to thank you all the panels for, for participating in our webinar today and sharing their expertise, their experiences, and their unique takes in the tribal communities. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Margot Hill. She'll introduce the next webinar topic. So I am really excited to invite all of you to our second part in our Walking Towards Justice in Indian Country. Um, that will be August 12th when we will focus on missing and murdered indigenous girls and women. Uh, we have thousands of indigenous girls and women that go missing on our roadways in North America. Um, and we wanna shed some light and look for some transportation solutions to help uh, protect women as they travel on our roadways, our highways and our, and our walking ways. We will have Jessica uh, McDermott, uh, author of Highway of Tears, it's a true story of, of the, the racism and indifference and the pursuit of justice for missing, murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and we will also have Karina Miller from the uh, Warm Springs Nation. Uh, she's a candidate for the Oregon State Senate. Uh, we will have uh, Laura Harjo. She's a Native American professor in uh, indigenous planning and community development. And we will have, um, uh, we are very pleased to announce uh, that U.S. Congresswoman Deborah Holland uh, uh, from New Mexico has really demonstrated her leadership in this area. Um, she's uh, sponsored legislation on murdered, missing Indigenous women and girls, uh, the Not Invisible Act in 2019. So she'll be joining us. Um, in this panel, we will consider the unique mo mobility patterns and risk factors of Indigenous girls and women. We will discuss federal policies, law enforcement, media response, and what communities are doing to stop this injustice. We will hear the stories of females that went missing along a stretch of Highway uh, 16 in Northwestern British Columbia called the Highway of Tears. 
Uh, this book gives a voice to girls and women who have gone missing. And uh, we're looking at what is the legislative response um, in uh, the, the Americas here in the United States. We'll consider possible transportation solutions on how we can protect all women who walk and travel on our roadways. So I'm really excited. I encourage you, uh, please read our two books. Uh, number one, we have a, a book, The Roundhouse by Louise Eldridge. And it's a novel about a woman who was living on a reservation in North Dakota, um, and she's attacked. And the story is a told through the eyes of her young son. Um, and it's really, a, it's just a fun um, exciting uh, story that's told from young um, young people's perspective, like a coming of age, um, and it goes through kind of the federal Indian law and jurisdictional issues. And then we have um, the Highway of Tears, as I mentioned, by Jessa McDermott, um, that tells the story of Indigenous girls and women that went missing along Highway uh, 16. I can't tell you how um, how much I enjoyed both of these. Uh, novels. Uh, you know, Jessica is a investigative reporter and worked really hard to tell the stories of these indigenous women. And this Louise Eldridge, the Roundhouse novel, is is a great read. It's well written. Um, I can't tell you. I've I, I've listened to them on Audible. I've read them and reread them. So I highly recommend these books. They're a great summer read. Um, and so I, I invite you to join us on August twelfth. Uh, we'll send out the notice for Walking America, uh, uh, America Walks. So, Nemeth Weechdemen, until we see you again, Lem Lunch. Wow. Thank you so much, Margot, Tabitha, Misty, Sharon, and Hollyanna, for a fabulous webinar. I really appreciate your expertise and experience and, and sharing um, insights into the issue of. Uh, tribal planning and pedestrian safety and 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 some great suggestions for addressing those problems i also want to uh, thank our sponsors uh, again for supporting our webinar series uh, they are all illustrated here and uh, just give everyone a heads up for upcoming webinars with america walks uh, july 8th uh, we have walking as a practice what does it mean to you uh, july 22nd the nature fix and then the second in this walking towards justice in indian country series on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and margot hill will be back as the guest moderator for that webinar on august the 12th so with that i will thank you all for your time for participating in today's webinar and just leave you with a screen of those two books that we recommend uh you read before august 12th in order to be prepared for a great webinar on the very distressing condition of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls please complete the survey uh when uh, when, when you log off the webinar and we look forward to seeing you next time